Okay, so thank you so much for joining us today for today's congressional briefing. It's titled Obesity, the Cost of No Coverage, hosted by Healthy Women, the nation's leading independent nonprofit health information source for women. I'm Beth Garner. I'm a women's health physician. I practiced clinical medicine for several years before joining the pharma industry, where I have now worked for about 17 years. I'm also the immediate past president of AMWA, the American Medical Women's Association, and this is the longest running nonprofit organization for women physicians. So very excited for this panel today. Um, and during the panel, we'll present the perspectives of healthcare providers, patient advocates, an economist, and policymakers on obesity. Specifically, they'll reorient us on our understanding of obesity to be one of a chronic disease, which is a critical part of this conversation. And they'll speak on the need to ensure access for persons living with obesity to effective, scientifically proven treatment uh, options. They'll discuss the policy solutions we can leverage to make access a reality. And they'll educate us on the economic health and social costs of not expanding coverage. So we'll begin today with opening remarks from Beth Bataglino. She's the president and CEO of Healthy Women. So Beth, take it away. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm Beth Bataglino, president and CEO of Healthy Women. We are so happy you can join us for this important conversation on the real world and economic impacts of a lack of access to obesity treatment options. With four out of 10 American adults living with obesity, access to and insurance coverage for treatment options is essential. For those who do not know us, Healthy Women is the leading independent nonprofit information source for women. And for more than 35 years, we have been dedicated to educating midlife women so that they can make informed health decisions, advocate for themselves, and prioritize their health and wellness. We have a proven and to be a trusted resource by providing credible, evidence-based, up-to-date information to women who need it. One of the aspects of our mission that I'm most proud of is the ability to convene and amplify essential conversations like this one about obesity. This chronic disease increases the risks of other serious health conditions, such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and certain cancers. For the past few years, Healthy Women has been working to educate women and their healthcare providers about the intersection of obesity and other healthcare conditions. Through the Reclaim Your Wellness campaign, we've amplified the voices of real women living with obesity to help reduce stigma and advocate for whole person care and access to life-saving treatments. Leaving people living with obesity without access to safe and effective treatment options can have significant health and economic impacts, which we will hear more about today. Healthy Women is not alone in this space. There is so much outstanding work being done to change the landscape for people living with obesity, including these organizations who have partnered with us. I applaud and thank you. I also want to extend my sincere gratitude to Eli Lilly and company for their support that made this congressional briefing possible. Lastly, thank you to our accomplished lineup of speakers and all of you for being here today. I know you're gonna find this conversation worthwhile. Thank you again. Thanks so much, Beth. It's always insightful to hear about all the work that you do with healthy women, just amazing. So we're gonna transition now to a discussion of policy proposals pending at both the federal and the state level that center on improving access to effective treatments for obesity. So first we're gonna hear recorded remarks from Congressman Larry Bouchon of Indiana, 
himself a physician, co-sponsor, primary sponsor of the Treat and, Re um, and Reduce Obesity Act, or TROA, as it's well known, in the House of Representatives, which centers on improving access to treatments for patients through Medicare. We'll then hear from Congresswoman Sheila Scherfelis McCormick of Florida, I practiced that a few times and still didn't quite get it, um, who is who will be with us here in person, which is just great. Uh, she too is a co-sponsor of TROA for whom tackling inadequate access to quality health care is a long-standing priority. She also co-led a resolution earlier this year on World Obesity Day, calling for Congress to take actions that prevent, address, and treat obesity as a disease. Thanks for inviting me to participate in today's congressional briefing on obesity, the cost of no coverage. As a heart surgeon for over 15 years, I saw patients struggle with obesity. While eating right and exercising are integral to leading a healthy life, for some with this chronic disease, following these approaches alone is not enough. Like heart disease, there are genetic factors that sometimes simply cannot be overcome. Accessing treatment is key to success, especially treatment that helps prevent severe disease. The importance of losing some weight, whether 20 pounds or 50 pounds, cannot be overstated, as numerous studies have demonstrated how excessive weight contributes to hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, fatty liver disease, pulmonary disease, gallbladder disease, coronary heart disease, cancer, osteoarthritis, and numerous other conditions. Today, treatment options exist that can help patients achieve successful management of their obesity, but too many patients cannot access them due to insurance barriers rooted in an outdated understanding of obesity as something that occurs because you don't eat a healthy diet or exercise and completely doesn't acknowledge the role that genetics can play. That is why I'm proud to support the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, this bipartisan, bicameral legislation was introduced this Congress and centers on expanding access to CMS coverage for treatments for obesity. Four out of 10 American adults live with obesity and the incidence of obesity is rising. Obesity is linked to about 300,000 deaths annually. We must stop stigmatizing people and start making treatments available to patients. Access to treatment not only improves outcomes for patients, but also reduces healthcare costs associated with not treating this disease and many of the comorbid conditions I previously mentioned. This legislation aligns with my long-term priorities in the health space, including expanding choices for patients and moving toward a paradigm where we provide care that keeps people healthy rather than waiting until they're extremely sick and the associated healthcare costs balloon. Only in Washington at the Congressional Budget Office have they seemingly not heard this common saying that an one ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So after many years of advocating for better health policies that refocus our health care system towards keeping people healthy versus simply paying after they get sick, I am pleased to see TROA garnering a lot of support and momentum in the markup process. I am pleased to see so many dialing in today and a growing list of co-sponsors. I hope you will collaborate with me and my colleagues to finally pass this legislation this year. Thank you for all of your efforts. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Sheila Sherfless McCormick, and I represent South Florida's 20th District. I'm honored to join you all today to address a critical and pervasive health issue affecting millions of Americans every day, obesity. As an ardent advocate for healthcare, I am determined to ensure that we take action that prevents, addresses, and treats obesity as a disease. Obesity affects communities across every corner of our nation, but hits hardest the underserved populations, including communities of color, low-income communities, and those who live in rural areas. Obesity also disproportionately impacts, so much so that it is associated with an increased risk of pregnancy loss. The statistics are quite sobering. Over 42% of adults and over 19% of children and adolescents in the United States live with obesity. In addition to the health consequences rising, obesity rates hurts the economy. The federal government spent approximately $283 billion on obesity-related direct health costs in 2023. 
which are expected to rise by 526.5 billion by 2033. This economic toll underscores the urgent need for Congress to act decisively and preventatively. This is why I was proud to introduce a resolution recognizing the need for Congress to prevent, address, and treat obesity with the seriousness it deserves. By treating obesity as a disease and focusing on the long-term comorbidities it causes, we can pave the way for a healthier future for all Americans. Every person living with obesity deserves access to comprehensive care necessary to improve their health and well being, just as they would for any other chronic disease. Today, new treatment options exist that can help patients achieve successful management of their obesity. By mere access to these treatments, nutritionists and dietitians remain limited often due to an out-of-date understanding of obesity and its characterization. It is a matter of fairness and equity, and my striving for eradicating these barriers are illustrated not only through my co-sponsorship of the Treat and Reduce, uh, Reduce Obesity Act of 2023, but also through the recent introduction of my very own resolu resolution that aims to recognize the need of Congress to prevent, address, and treat obesity as a disease in the United States. We must continue to work together to recognize obesity for what it is, a disease that requires comprehensive treatment and coverage. I want to thank Healthy Women for their attention and commitment to this critical issue. Together, we can make a difference and ensure that healthier future for all Americans. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate all of your comments. Um, thank you so much to Congressman Bouchon and to Congresswoman Sherfulis McCormick, getting there. We truly, truly appreciate your leadership in working to advance policy solutions at the federal and the state level to advance care for people living with obesity by expanding access treatment. So again, thank you so much. Great, great, great comments. So next, uh, we're gonna hear from an obesity medicine specialist, Dr. Alicia Shelley. Dr. Shelley is based in Georgia and is the lead physician at Wellstar Primary Care or Primary Care of Douglasville, an affiliate of Wellstar Centers of Best Health. She's also a podcast host, a speaker, and an author, and founder of Healthy Living for Life. So looking forward to this. Dr. Shelley, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me today and being able to talk about the cost of obesity. Um, as a primary care obesity medicine physician, I've had the opportunity to see patients at their lowest where they're discouraged, where they're trying to lose weight, and then see as we do different uh, obesity treatments and implement lifestyle change, medications, and just seeing how they flourish and how not only do they improve uh, their weight, but they improve their health outcomes. They improve their, their, um, me uh, their medical complications. They get off medications. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to come in in my office and say, I feel so much better, doc. So, and it's so, thank you so much for putting on this briefing and I'm so glad to have that opportunity. I would like to start off with sharing just a case that I saw in one of in my clinic. Next slide. This is a 20, uh, this is a case of a young woman in 2022. She was 38. She came for a consultation on her weight. Uh, at the time when I saw her, she weighed 770 pounds. But after looking through her chart, her highest weight that was documented was 793 pounds. So she was very close to 800 pounds. And she was very young at 38. Um, she had struggled all her life to lose weight. But she was like many Americans. She may lose weight, gain it back, lose it again. And it's just sometimes this vicious cycle. Um, she had a, a past medical history of type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and obstructive sleep apnea. And just recently, a couple of months before she came to me, she was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Now, mind you, she's 38. And I asked her, I asked all my patients this, like, what's motivating you today to lose weight? Or, or what's your why for losing weight? She looked me in my face and she said, to not die. Doc, I just don't want to die. I want to be here for my family and I want to travel more. A lot of times with my patients, they ask me, why is this happening? Why am I having such difficulty? 
Next slide. And I tell them that with obesity, it is a chronic disease. It is not a character failure. It's There's more to it than just um, eating less and moving more. Um, fortunately, in our medical society, we've told our patients, hey, hey, just eat less and move more and you'll lose weight. But for many people, uh, for most, for all people, excuse me, obesity is a chronic disease. It has multiple risk factors. Next slide of what causes it. It can be due to endocrine diseases like hypothyroidism, polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS for short. It can be medical. There are certain medications that can increase your weight, like steroids, or certain antidepressants that can cause, or even birth control that can cause people to gain weight. It can be neurobehavioral, such as anxiety, depression, that can lead people to gain weight. And of course, genetics. It can run in the family, where you can see families where um, many people in that family are struggling with their weight. Uh, and environmental. Sometimes it is not safe for people to walk outside their home. So they stay indoors and they gain weight that way. So their obesity is a multifactorial relapsing chronic disease. And it's more to it than just, um, uh, than just eating less and moving more. Next slide. When we look at um, kind of physiologic, what we see is that with obesity is due to excessive body fat. That body fat that's um, behind, that's underneath that skin layer, and then also the fat that actually is surrounding in our blood vessels and actually surrounding the organs that can lead to many medical complications. Next slide. With obesity, it has been associated with over 200 medical conditions like um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, gallbladder disease, sleep apnea, coronary heart disease like diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and it can even increase your risk for cancer. Cancer, specifically in breast, uterine, cervical, colon cancers. And then of course, osteoarthritis, it can worsen one's osteoarthritis. So obesity affects so many systems of the body. Next slide. And the rates of obesity are increasing. Next slide. When we look at the um, weight, the maps, the, um, the obesity map trends uh, from 2011, this is coming from the CDC. You can see in America, there were some areas, about 30 to 35% of, of individuals who were living with obesity, but you had more states that were in that yellow and green area. Next slide. For, we fast forward four years, you start seeing more states that are becoming into that 30 to 35 range of people who are living with obesity and less of the green states. Next slide. 2019, now we're getting even higher. We're in Mississippi. You're seeing people who are 40 to 45% are living with obesity. And then next slide. And then in 2022, only one state, one state, is in the green range, which is the District of Columbia. But everywhere else, you can see where obesity is increasing. And in some states, it's now 45 to 50%. Next slide. One in five Americans are living with obesity. One in five. And is it, is, next slide. And it is anticipated, or it is predicted by 2030, six years from now, that nearly half of all U.S. adults will be living with obesity. One in two adults. Next slide. And when we look at the treatments that we have to treat obesity, we have our lifestyle interventions, we have anti-obesity medications, and we have bariatric surgery. Next slide. And when the studies have looked to see how these treatments can affect cardiovascular disease, Specifically, this is the semaglutide and cardiovascular study that was released late last year. And what it showed was that in individuals who had a pre-existing condition of heart failure, stroke, heart attack, peripheral vascular disease, next slide, that it reduced their cardiovascular death by 20%. 20%, which is on the same line as taking a cholesterol medication or a statin. Next slide. 
And this New, Eng New England Journal of Medicine study, it looked at semaglutide, which is the generic for Wagovi and Ozempic. Um, I looked at people who had type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And the effect of taking this medication is that it reduced kidney complications. Next slide. Mm -hmm. The risk of kidney compl uh, complications. And then recently, next slide, uh, just last month, Terzepatide, which is the generic for Zetbound and Manjaro, they looked at the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea um, and obesity in individuals taking terzepatide versus uh, placebo. And they noticed that it reduced sleep apnea. Next slide. Not only that, it reduced it by 50%. So, and when they looked at bariatric surgery, the long-term outcomes of bariatric surgery in people who had type 2 diabetes, next slide, the remission it, of, of type 2 diabetes, they didn't even need medication. They didn't need insulin. They didn't need um, taking medications after bariatric surgery. Next slide. And the Swedish did a study looking at life expectancy after bariatric surgery. And they noted, next slide, that they had a longer life expectancy with the treatment of bariatric surgery. Next slide. So when we look at this case, um, we'll go back to the case here, but I just wanna say one thing is that these obesity treatments are not just to allow people to lose weight and to look good and to go to a wedding. These treatments are improving people's medical outcomes. They're allowing people to have um, uh, less complications and improving um, their, uh, their life outcomes. Now, I want to just go back to the case. So back in 2022, when I first saw her, we put my patient on an anti-obesity medication. She started swimming throughout the week. She decreased her caloric intake. And last week, in, um, last week I saw her for a follow-up visit. And at that time, she had lost over she had lost 415 pounds. She was now 355 and she started at 770. Her heart failure had resolved. Her cardiologist said, hey, your heart is strong. Her diabetes was controlled. And I didn't mention this, but she was walking without a cane. When she came to see me two years ago, she had a cane. Now she was walking without a cane. She didn't need any help getting on the exam table. And I, I noted that she had like a tan and she was like, I was like, oh, have you been, you know, did you just come back from somewhere? She's like, yes, I came back from Florida, from Florida. So this same lady who I saw two years ago, who her goal was to not die and to travel more, her medical conditions had improved. She no longer had to worry about her heart failing. She no longer had to worry about worsening arthritis, worsening pain, and her diabetes is controlled. So she's not worrying about the complications that can, can arise from long-term diabetes. For this patient, next slide, the cost of coverage for this patient was, next slide, life, life. We gave her her life back. Now, next slide. The cost of no coverage is premature death. Next slide. Please, please support the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. Um, because this is not only giving people their life back, but this is allowing them to treat, treat obesity as a chronic disease and allowing them to be able to get their life back and to reduce their medical complications. Thank you so much for your time. Next slide. Here are my references that I have referenced as far as the different studies for you to review. Um, next slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Shelley. That was amazing. So insightful. Um, so helpful. All the explanations you gave us around the scientific underpinnings of obesity, the multifactorial nature of this disease, the association with over 200 medical conditions, right? I mean, clearly, clearly, people who are living with obesity should be able to access these effective treatment options. So thank you again. So we are gonna shift now to hear the perspectives of someone who's living with obesity and the impacts of being able to access treatment. So we're so pleased to welcome Jesse McDonald. Jesse, take it away. Hi, everyone. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. Is my video working? You look great. Yes. We can see you. Oh, okay. Sorry. It doesn't show on my end. Um, I first just want to say that uh, I want to start uh, by thanking you all for even doing this briefing and supporting uh, people living in larger bodies uh, like me. A lot of times in my life, because I couldn't lose the weight, I felt overlooked and dis uh, disregarded by the medical community. So I really just appreciate this effort so much. And um, to be seen is to be loved. So thank you so much for that. My weight loss journey started in uh, September of 2022. I was going to see my primary care doctor for my annual physical. And I had been with my doctor for a really long time. Uh, every year we would talk about what I was doing to lose weight. I would tell him, well, in the summer I did this. I was unsuccessful. Uh, before that, in the winter time, I tried this, was also unsuccessful. Um, and but that year, uh, he had had some luck with some uh, different patients of, of new anti obesity medications that were on the market. And he, before I left, he had said, Well, I hope that your insurance uh, covers them, and kind of chuckled and I left feeling like I had a really good chance. Uh, you know, I'm from Michigan and I have, I think the highest or the most common insurance that they carry here. It's very good insurance. I thought out of the three medications that he had talked about that one of them surely would be covered. Uh, but what a disappointment when I got home and called the pharmacy and found out that not only were they not covered by insurance to access them, they were more than my mortgage payment, my monthly mortgage payment. And that news made me feel really low because I felt like it was a clear sign that these medications weren't made for me. They seemed like they must have been made for people with money. And that certainly uh, wasn't me at that time. And I also kicked myself for having a sliver of hope that something about my weight could change in a real way. Because those days I had spent a lot of time reassuring myself that it was okay to live uh, in a bigger body. And I would continually try uh, to lose weight. I wouldn't give up, but I still deserved a beautiful life, even if it wasn't um, in a thin uh, body. A uh, few days after that, I was on TikTok and that uh, TikTok algorithm blessed me in the best way. Uh, there was a ton of people on the app talking about one of the anti-obesity medications the manufacturer had has a $25 coupon on uh, their site. And all you have to do is fill out the form and bring it to your pharmacist and you'll be good to go. So I ran to the site, filled it out, got the um, coupon code number, took it to my pharmacy. And sure enough, uh, one month, four shots once a week uh, was only $25. I noticed a change in my body right away with that anti-obesity medication. The morning after I took my first shot, I sat down to have breakfast and, you know, made a breakfast sandwich, cut it in half. And once I ate half of it, I realized how full I was. And not only was I full, I wasn't obsessively thinking about wanting to eat that other half. And over days, the next days and the next weeks, um, I realized this medication showed me how much time I really was spending on thinking about food all the time. It absolutely was an obsession for me um, and not normal. Uh, I've been on uh, anti-obesity medication now for almost two years. I've lost 11, I'm sorry, 111 pounds. Uh, this medication has allowed me to move my body like I've always wanted to. I think people misunderstand that people in bigger bodies absolutely do want to be physical and want to move in beautiful ways. And it's just that their bodies 
won't let them. Um, feeling and looking good is everything, but what honestly this medicine, what has given me the most gratitude is now, instead of reminding myself that I'm okay or was okay in a bigger body, I'm now having an inner dialogue of throughout the day of all the things that I can do now. Um, I no longer uh, say no when friends want to go on long walks. Uh, when my niece and nephew ask to play catch, I say yes. When they say, Aunt Jessie, will you swim out into the middle of the lake with me and swim back? I say, absolutely. Uh, a few months ago, I hired a personal trainer and I'm doing things that are beyond my craziest imagination right now. I feel like I have such this new open window where I want to be so strong and I I never thought that I could get there. So I want to take all of, all of the stuff that I can do now and just live everything that I wanted to do. Um, so for me, the cost of no coverage is having to give up this active life that I have now. Uh, this medication has made a once already beautiful life with a much sweeter one. So thank you for listening. That was absolutely wonderful, Jesse. Thank you so, so much. Powerful story. And you just illustrated it so well for us, you know, what the journey is like for um, individuals living with obesity. And we truly, truly appreciate your willingness to be so open and to share. And I absolutely believe in you. You're doing amazingly well. So thank you so much. So our final speaker is Dr. Chad Meyerhofer the Arthur F. Searing Professor and Chair of the Economics Department at Lehigh University. Healthcare economics is one of his specialties, and he has published studies on the impact of obesity on our economy and healthcare costs. We're really fortunate to have his valuable perspective, and Dr. Meyerhofer, please take it away. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to, just, to speak at this very important briefing. What I'm going to do uh, this afternoon is discuss some estimates that I've developed with my co-authors, John Colley at Cornell University and Adam Beener at Lafayette College, of the medical care and productivity costs of obesity. Next slide, please. So we've determined that obesity raises medical care costs by about $2,800 per individual per year. And that's total cost, including those paid by insurance companies and those paid by the individual. If we add that up over all people living with obesity in the United States, in 2021 US dollars, that comes to approximately $290 billion. And the majority of that is paid by third party payers, which are private insurance companies and public programs such as Medicaid and Medicare. So to put that number in perspective, that $290 billion, we can compare that to the total cost of the Medicare program in 2021, and that was almost $700 billion. And our interest costs on the national debt were $352 billion in that year. So you can see the total medical care costs of obesity are a significant fiscal payment, fiscal responsibility that the country bears. Now, obesity also affects productivity in the workplace. And we've estimated that the costs of obesity that are derived from the fact that people living with obesity are more likely to take sick days and um, have what we call work loss, that those costs of absenteeism from work are between 15 billion and $30 billion a year in the US. Next slide, please. So one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that the costs of obesity, and I'm talking about medical care costs now, they're not increasing linearly with body weight. So what this graph shows you is the relationship between total medical expenditures and body mass index. And that's the solid black line, and it has a J shape. The small dotted line is showing you the prevalence of the population at each body mass index level. So 
one of the things that's apparent from this, this, this figure is that the medical care costs of obesity of someone in the healthy weight range, the overweight range, and the initial class one obesity range are not very different. It's only when you get to body mass index levels in the class two or class three obesity range that costs increase, but they increase very rapidly at an increasing rate. What that means is that the reductions in medical care costs from treating class three obesity are substantial. Next slide, please. This is another way of looking at the same information. So we predict that a healthy weight person will spend on average about $2,500 per year, say in total medical care costs, where a person living with class three obesity could be spending over $9,000 a year in medical care costs. Next slide, please. And these costs have been increasing for all payers. So here, if we focus on the under 65 population, we can look at the trend among private insurance payers for, um, uh, for obesity-related illness, and then the trend among the Medicaid programs across all the states in the US. And both of those have been increasing at a similar rate. The only thing that hasn't been increasing are individual out-of-pocket costs. They've held relatively steady and one reason for that is that individuals with obesity, generally their medical care costs, their excessive medical care costs are, occur after they pay the deductible. So third-party payers are um, bearing most of these costs. Next slide, please. So because the relationship between medical care costs and body max index is nonlinear, what that means is that the savings achieved from reducing body weight depends on an individual's starting BMI level. So one of the things that we've done is we've calculated the savings in medical care costs that a person could achieve at each BMI level uh, above obesity for a different magnitude increase in B, a different increase, uh, or I'm sorry, a different reduction in BMI. So for example, a 5% reduction in BMI, a 10% reduction in BMI, and a 20% reduction in BMI. And those numbers are all on this table here. And what I'm going to do is just pick out a few examples to make this more concrete. Uh, next slide, please. So as a case study of these cost savings, we can consider somebody with a BMI of 35. So 35 is, is right at the top of the class one obesity range, right in between class one and class two obesity. Let's say they are able to reduce their body, their body mass index by 15%. That would put them at just under a BMI of 30, which is just in the top of the overweight range. So a person who's able to do that is gonna reduce their medical care costs. And again, this is total medical care costs borne by all payers by about $1,500 per year. Now, if we compare that to somebody who is in say the middle of the class three obesity range and they're able to reduce their body weight by say 20%, which puts them in the class one range. So they're still in uh, the class one obesity range, but they're going from class three to class one they're able to reduce, they're going to reduce their medical care costs by about $11,600 a year. And then finally, if we take somebody with a BMI of 45, which is uh, at the high end of the class three range, and they experience a 20% reduction in BMI uh, to 36, which is actually in the class two range, like just in the class two range, even though they're still in that class two range, reducing their body, their body mass index by 20% is going to reduce medical care costs by $29,000 per year, which is pretty substantial. Okay, so if you look at those different case studies of cost savings, we can then compare those to, um, we can then compare those to the costs of different treatments. And there are three primary treatments that Dr. Shelley mentioned. One is anti-obesity medications. So, you know, it's difficult to pin down these costs precisely, but the 12-month cost of an anti-obesity medication is around $11,000 per year. 
So you can see that would essentially be similar to the cost savings of somebody reducing their body mass index by 20% if they started at a BMI of 42. Okay. And so those are both annual costs. Moving on to the cost of bariatric surgery, that's going to be higher, about $23,000. But it's not exactly a one-time cost because there are some follow-on costs after a person has bariatric surgery, but they're much lower compared to the initial cost. So you have an initial cost of $23,000, but you can compare that to cost savings that are annual um, that are associated with uh, reductions in body mass index of uh, 20% for people in BMI ranges in the class three obesity range. And, and, and those, those, those uh, savings are actually higher in, in a single year than the initial cost of the bariatric surgery. And then finally, the cost of a weight loss program that includes food for a year, it's going to be roughly $5,800 per year. And so that's going to essentially be similar to the reduction in medical care costs that somebody in the class three or class two range would experience um, if they were just reducing their body weight by, you know, five to 10%. So if we compare these costs of treatment relative to the medical care costs of obesity, then it's clear to see that in many cases they're cost effective. And we're only considering here medical care costs. There's a lot of other cost savings that you can achieve by reducing obesity, um, including uh, increase, you know, in lower productivity losses. And then of course, there's a lot of benefits that we're not even discussing here in terms of um, a person's health and other dimensions. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to uh, touch on the uh, effect of obesity on workplace productivity, uh, what this figure shows you is that a healthy weight person is estimated to um, have two days of work loss. So they're you know, a little over two days per year when they wouldn't go to work because of sickness or illness. Whereas a person with class three obesity is expected to have about nine days of work loss. So you have about seven additional days per year of lost productivity due to obesity-related illness. Uh, next slide, please. And we can also translate this to lost wages. So for example, again, a person of healthy weight um, is expected to lose approximately $250 to $500 per year in wages because of, of illness. And that, that difference is just depends on whether they lose like a full day of work or a half day of work. But if we compare that to somebody with class three obesity, then they're expected to lose, uh, say, nine, between $1,900 or, and $900 in wages per year for, because of obesity-related illness. So, uh, so that's the very, you know, these, these expected lost wages due to absenteeism are very high. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then this is just something, most of the figures that I've shown you are published in our recent uh, chapter in volume two of the Handbook of Obesity. Uh, this is actually information that we haven't published yet, but we're working on just to give you a, 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 a sense of one, you know, one, one treatment, and that's bariatric surgery. Uh, recently in 2022 and 2023, the guidelines for um, who qualifies for bariatric surgery uh, changed and they changed substantially. So, you know, for in particular, before these guidelines were revised, we had about 29 million people in the United States who are eligible for bariatric surgery. After the revision of the guidelines, uh, that more than doubled. So, you have an additional 35 million people in the US who are eligible for bariatric surgery. And a lot of that had to do with changes in the BMI threshold for adults, also uh, changes in the BMI threshold for Asian Americans, and expansions of bariatric surgery to, to individuals that, uh, between the ages of 13 and 17. So in general, access to the different treatments is expanding in terms of eligibility at a pretty rapid rate. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Meyerhofer. Very, very informative.
All right, so we're gonna go to a brief panel discussion. If all the panelists please could uh, get your uh, videos on and your sound. So we have a few prepared questions and uh, you know, I'm gonna hopefully also be able to get some questions from, um, from the audience. So let's start with the prepared ones. Jesse first. <laughs> So I tend to believe that a lot of the issues we have, um, and certainly um, obesity, I think, is one of them. There are issues um, with stigma, um, with bias, with discrimination and things like that, that I think get in the way, right, of some of the work that needs to be done. Can you talk about that? And then and possibly uh, Dr. Shelley as well, if you have any thoughts there. Yeah, well, I really do think that that is such an old way of thinking that people with obes obesity um, are lacking motivation or don't have drive or just lazy. That's simply just not true. And one of the things that with the anti-obesity medication has shown how tr untrue that really is, because just with some help, we really can get um, the numbers down with our bodies. So yeah, for sure. Great point. Yeah, I, and I agree with her, you know, in the med in the healthcare setting, there is a lot of bias where people who are living with obesity may not get um, the proper care because the provider thinks that they're lazy because of their weight or that they're unwilling to change or, or, or you know, um, do what needs to be done. Um, you can see weight stigma in the workplace where somebody living with obesity doesn't get that job in front where they are the, you know, the spokesperson, they're getting the job that's in the back where no one sees them. Um, you know, in, in schools, you see bullying uh, of the person, mm -hmm. the child who is living with obesity. So the stigma is, is, is very high. And um, hopefully as we can continue to educate people that obesity is a chronic disease, that we can, we can see change. Yes. Thank you for that. So, so important in my opinion. So thanks for those, uh, those reflections. Um, Jesse, just one more question for you there too, then based on your, your own experience, right? How can people who are living with obesity better advocate for themselves? You've clearly done that. So what are, what are the messages that you would send? Well, the, I think that I would recommend a way to advocate for yourself is to go onto these social media platforms. There's so much information on what other people are doing, what they have found that have worked in their state. Their doctor said this, this because he worded it this way, it was helpful with the insurance companies to cover it additional uh, or better or whatnot. Um, but yeah, there's so many platforms you can get on where people are doing the same thing. They have a great information. So I would advocate myself that way. Get out there, start reading. Thank you for that. Dr. Shelley, one more for you. So in your experience, to what extent would you say the lack of access to insurance coverage for treatments, how do those impact your ability to provide the best counsel, the best care for your patients who are living with obesity? Oh, it, it extremely, it hinders me. Um, when I see a patient and, and we're having a consultation, you know, I, first of all, I look to see what their medical conditions are, whether they would be a good fit for certain medications. Um, but then secondly, I have to look at their insurance to see if their insurance will cover it. Uh, sometimes I have to ask the patient to contact your insurance and see if they cover these medications um, mm -hmm. because sometimes they don't. Uh, right now, for certain um, injectables, um, like injectables, uh, anti-obesity medications, they may not cover it unless you have a certain diagnosis of type 2 diabetes or even um, cardiovascular disease. And so for I have some people who are on Medicare who, you know, are having other medical conditions, but just don't have those two who would benefit from these medications, but we can't give that to them because the insurance doesn't cover it. And like Jesse was saying, it can be an arm and a leg to, to, yeah. uh, to afford it. Like you're, this is more than a car note or rent um, to afford these medications. And so it really, it's a, not only a lack of access, but we are able, these medications have been shown to be so helpful for patients and we don't have that access due to coverage. Mm -hmm. so, so much more to get done there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Meyerhofer, so, 
your your talk was so interesting. So really for a long time, we really we didn't typically associate the word epidemic with the economy, right? And and many people still don't, I think. And that changed, I think, in, in many ways, um, back with the, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, where it was very clear, right? Um, and obesity is also characterized as an epidemic. We heard the, the numbers and how things are, you know, increasing. How can we, from your perspective, better frame the rising prevalence of obesity to the public, right, and to policymakers as an economic vulnerability? I think everything you said today was so relevant. How do you do that in a way that's sort of easy to understand by the public and policymakers? Right. Yeah, I think that's important to, to communicate. And I think there's a there's several ways you could do that. One is that you could really you know, point to these costs and the costs borne by public programs as a fiscal solvency issue. So, you know, these the cost of obesity, they elevate, you know, payments by the federal, federal and state governments significantly. And in order to <clears throat> cover those costs, <clears throat> excuse me, um, those entities have to you know, collect them from taxes and those higher rates of taxes affect economic growth. So these costs are significant enough to filter back into the economy and and sort of affect economic growth because they're uh, the, the burden of them, many, much of the burden of them is falling on taxpayers indirectly through these Medicare and Medicaid payments. The other way of communicating that is just the um, the cost of obesity to economic productivity in general uh, through things like work loss or lost wages. And, you know, there's a, a very large cost that nobody has really calculated accurately. And that's what we call presenteeism. So it's the reduction in productivity that individuals experience while at work because of illness. It's very hard to estimate that. It's yeah. you know much harder than okay a person didn't show up for work today and we can we can I, we can see that so those costs we don't know exactly what they are but we expect that they're much larger than say the cost of absenteeism of, of work loss um, and then the third area where in the, you know there's been research that shows that the cost of obesity filter back into the um, the economy are, have to do with actually national security and the ability to um, the ability to, to recruit soldiers into the armed forces has also been reduced uh, through the obesity epidemic. So you have like three three areas. You have general economic productivity, you have fiscal solvency, and then you have like military readiness. Thank you for that. Very interesting. So one last question and um, everyone can answer, all of our panelists. So given this high prevalence of um, obesity in the US, the trends pointing to nearly half, as you, as you said, of all adults living with obesity by the end of the get decade, what are some specific ways that we, we all here, um, you know, can take action, immediate action, right? To improve the health of individuals, families, communities. I would say the first thing, um, Definitely support the TROA, uh, Treat and Reduce Obesity Bill, but also, you know, petitioning and advocating for yourself. Um, you know, if you have an employer who does not cover anti-obesity treatments, getting people together to have a petition so that they do add it on to your coverage. You know, petitioning not only your Congress, your local congressperson or senator, so that they can get on board and support this act is going to be important as well. Um, and then also, I would say the other thing is um, reducing weight stigma, too, and how you treat others. So just having an internal look and, and how what your views are and your biases and seeing if you can change that so that you can treat other uh, people living with obesity in a better life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think we need some more standardization of coverage rules for anti-obesity medications. I mean, right now, uh, there's a lot of variability in those rules across insurers. And so access to anti-obesity treatments, it varies a lot by the generosity of insurance. And that generosity is correlated with socioeconomic status and it cuts across mm -hmm. racial and ethnic lines too. So you have a lot of inequality and in access to care when it comes to anti-obesity medications that you don't, and anti-obesity treatments that you don't have for other more standardized treatments, such as like insulin or, you know, um, 
you know, heart, heart care procedures and things like that. So that standardization of eligibility, I think, is, is an important thing. Jesse, anything to add? No, I just, I really agree with Dr. Shelley. It's so important to uh, go to your human resources, talk to other coworkers, um, find out how and if the, these uh, medications are covered. And when they're not, we need to ask for it. Um, just be, be the voice and be the face and ask, ask for the coverage. Thank you for that. So I think given that it's 157 and probably right around 158, I'm not sure we have um, time for Q&A from the audience, but um, perhaps we can uh, reply or, or send some, some answers in some other uh, way. I'm going to quickly go through some takeaways. We could go to that. Um, this has been great. And honestly, um, thank you so, so much, first of all, to all of our panelists today, incredible. Just a few quick um, takeaways. First of all, you heard all of this already, but obesity is clearly a multifactorial factorial chronic disease impacting 40% and it's gonna increase. Linked to many other con uh, chronic conditions, there are some of them very, very serious. Clearly social determinants of health complicate the ability to al alter lifestyles and all people living with obesity need access, that's clear. We need access to behavioral, nutrition, mental health counseling, as well as access to the FDA-approved anti-obesity medications and bariatric surgery, of course, when appropriate. These AOMs are promising, they're scientifically proven, they're effective, and they can clearly, from what we've heard today, assist people living with obesity in their weight management journey. Insurance coverage for all parts of this toolkit is key to achieving success. Comprehensive care and insurance coverage for all parts of this care are the keys to success in addressing obesity. So key, you heard this from Dr. Shelley a minute ago, co-sponsor and pass the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act and support complementary state legislation. And with that, I will thank you. Uh, Healthy Women would like to thank our co-sponsors. They're all listed on the slide for their so, uh, support of this event. And of course, to Eli Lilly for their financial support. And then lastly, again, Thanks to all of our speakers, Beth Badaglino, the representatives, Bouchon and Scherfeles, Dr. Shelley, Jesse McDonald, and Dr. Chad Meyerhoff. We're so, so grateful for your time and the perspectives you brought to this event. And with that, thank you so, so much, everyone, for dialing in. We hope this event was insightful and motivates you to take action on improving the standard of care for all people living with obesity. Thanks so much. <laughs>